As a moral being, I feel I owe it to the suffering slave and to the deluded master, to my country and all the world, to do all I can to overturn a system of complicated crimes. Sarah and Angelina Grimke were sisters, raised in the slaveholding family in South Carolina. But their own personal religious awakenings would carry them far from home, converting them into outspoken abolitionists, and finally, women's rights activists. It was religion that carried them out of Charleston, not a hatred of slavery. They uh, were part of the Second Great Awakening process, seeking perfection. The Grimke sisters first became Quakers. Later, after hearing the impassioned anti-slavery speeches of William Lloyd Garrison, they became abolitionists. When their fervent anti-slavery speeches drew men as well as women to hear them, they provoked a public outcry. The congregational ministers meet and say, how can we stop this? They issue a pastoral letter that condemns the sisters and says that they are leading the culture to ruin. And it's at that point that Angelina and Sarah Grimke composed the defense of their speaking in terms of women's rights. Men and women were created equal. They are both moral and accountable beings. And whatever is right for man to do is right for women to do. In the rigidly structured society of the 1830s, Sarah and Angelina Grimke were on the fringes of respectability. But in their passion for religion and reform, the Grimke sisters epitomized the spirit of the times. The view of the terrible majesty of that God so overwhelmed I saw that my God mind. had an absolute right to do with me as I he turned pleased. about and fell on my knees, for I had not stood I desired to nothing stand. so much as to live to his glory, to serve him with my whole heart. An extraordinary religious enthusiasm enveloped American society from the 1790s into the 1840s. Religious leaders in America convinced Americans generally that religion was central to the development of American culture. They argued that without religion, this new independent society couldn't express itself, couldn't develop a system of morals and ethics, would have no values without religion. Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, even Episcopalians reached out to the American public, and in reaching out to the American public, they learned that revivalism, religious renewal, was among the most dynamic of all possible ways to infuse religion into the society. Many religious groups of the period were inspired by a belief that the second coming of Christ was imminent. The millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ, would be a time of perfection. And there were a number of groups who believed that this it was possible to achieve this perfectionism and prepare themselves for the millennium. One of the principal functions of any religious commune is to separate itself from the world, to declare itself independent of the world, free of the world, free to perfect their own religious teachings. Among the most successful millennial movements of the time was a group that became known for the ecstatic dancing that was the hallmark of its religious practice. The Shakers uh, actually started in England with a small Quaker group who believed that um, the, this, this time of the coming of Jesus was near, near at hand, very near at hand, and one young lady who was particularly gifted in speaking rose up to become the leader of this small group. Her name was Anne Lee. And they started their colonies in various parts of New England. Eventually, they had 22 colonies. Many of these became quite large. Anne Lee came to believe that she was, in fact, the second coming of Christ in person. And her group started to accept her as that. So uh, they started living it. They started living the millennium. Their lifestyle was complete communism. They lived together in great cleanliness, and uh, they, uh, men and the women were separated from each other. It was kind of a monastic order in a lot of ways. 
their services were famous for being, um, shall we say, exotic. Because they, there was no sexual relationship between the men and the women, there was the need for some outlet uh, for their enthusiasms and energy, and, they, and the dances apparently served those purposes. The practice of celibacy released Shaker women from childbearing, giving them a freedom that ordinary 19th century women did not have. In the Shaker religious system, women participated as equals. The women were treated very well. Uh, the men uh, and women shared the work equally. I would say that uh, among the various groups, the women were probably treated as well among the Shakers as any group uh, that I can think of. The Shaker population peaked in the 1830s, but their adherence to celibacy limited their growth, and their numbers steadily decreased during the remainder of the 19th century. In contrast to the Shakers, the Mormons made a mission out of reproduction and conversion. From a handful of believers in 1830, the Mormons multiplied to a membership of 10,000 in little more than a decade. Joseph Smith's success in establishing the Mormon movement derived, first of all, from the extraordinary religious ferment in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. There was an extraordinary variety of religious opinion circulating in America that confused many people. And Smith thought he could cut through it when he published the Book of Mormon, which established a new biblical text over which he believed there would be and could be no dispute. It's also during the April of that year, 1830, that using the book as the foundation, he uh, established the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, a year or so later, he added of Latter-day Saints. The Latter-day Saints is very important because it emphasizes the idea that Joseph Smith thought the end of time was very near at hand. The Mormons believed it was possible to create the kingdom of heaven on earth. And it was in Novu, Illinois, that they chose to build it. But when Joseph Smith introduced the practice of polygamy, there was trouble in paradise. Smith referred to the practice as the taking of spiritual wives and claimed that the doctrine had been revealed to him by God. Although Smith was considered a prophet, many in the Mormon church initially resisted polygamy, including Smith's own wife, Emma. Polygamy was never widespread. It was kept somewhat secret. And the polygamists tended to live in areas where they could support a large family on a farm and had an arrangement of that kind. Brigham Young himself said it was difficult to have so many wives because if he gave one a ribbon, he had to give all 27 a ribbon. The adoption of polygamy made the movement grossly notorious. There were armed conflicts over polygamy. Smith was assassinated. Mormons had to flee to Utah. And the Mormons became among the most hunted and reviled religious groups in the United States. The Mormon exodus from Illinois began in 1846 under the leadership of Brigham Young. Over the next few years, some 12,000 Mormons would make the difficult trek to present-day Utah. There, they built Salt Lake City, a feat of great industry and imagination. The Mormon experiment shows us, along with the Shaker experiment and a number of the other experiments in the 19th century, that almost anything was possible in terms of social arrangement. They were willing to try very radical lifestyles to try to achieve this uh, utopian dream, this dream of living in a world that was much better than the world they came from. The millennium can never reasonably be expected to arrive until those laws which God has implanted in the physical nature of man are equally with his moral laws universally known and obeyed. It's impossible to understand the nature of 19th century American reform without understanding the link to Christianity. Religion infused these movements not only with their ideals, but with their leaders. In part because of their religious roots, social reform movements offered many American women their first opportunity to take a role in public life. 
the perfectibility of human beings was uh, a, a basic tenet of the Second Great Awakening. And in this context, women gained uh, esteem that they hadn't had previously because they were now associated with a set of beliefs in which the natural, the, the human body, the landscape, was seen as evolving toward perfection. Let the women of a country be made virtuous and intelligent, and men will certainly be the same. Educate a woman, and the interests of a whole family are secured. Catherine Beecher was a pioneer in women's education. In 1823, she founded the Hartford Seminary to give women access to the kind of education available at colleges for men. Although Beecher believed the importance of women's education was second to none, she was no advocate of women's rights. Rather, she maintained that an improved education would make women better homemakers and teachers of the young. I am the revelation of hundreds of wailing, suffering creatures hidden in your private dwellings and in pens and cabins, shut out, cut off from all healing influences, from all mind-restoring cares. Dorothea Dix was a tireless campaigner for the reform of treatment of the insane. Her personal crusade took her on a national tour to investigate and document treatment of the mentally ill. The conditions she found were appalling. Dix lobbied for more humane treatment, and by 1852, 11 states had built hospitals to house and treat the insane. Drunkenness is the cause of nine-tenths of all the crime and wickedness in the world. Where is the drunkard that does not cruelly and inhumanely treat his wife? And how many drunkards are there who do not altogether refuse and neglect to provide for their wives and families if they do not totally abandon them? The temperance movement was supported by the leading Protestant ministers of the day, but it was the ladies who took the lead in their communities in the fight against drunkenness. In many ways, women had the most to gain. The temperance movement would train as organizers and public speakers many of the women who would later emerge as leaders in the women's rights movement. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. Oh, but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. In 1831, William Lloyd Garrison published the first issue of The Liberator. It signaled a radical shift in abolitionist philosophy. What made the Garrisonian movement, the American Anti-Slavery Society movement, so radical was its call for immediate emancipation. This took the place within anti-slavery of colonization and other forms of slower emancipation that called for, for example, slaveholders to be compensated for their loss of their slaves. And what made immediate emancipation so radical was that it accepted African Americans as fully human equals to white slaveholders or other white Americans. The transformation of people's attitudes about slavery was so profound in that period of time that it would be like today as if somehow people suddenly came to understand that the internal combustion engine was wrong. Slavery suddenly became a terrible sin, something that destroyed and crushed human beings, exploited them in endless numbers, corrupted the slaveholders themselves. And what used to be condonable, acceptable, and normal suddenly became a tremendous transgression in God's sight. Garrison was a major force behind abolition's new momentum. He was an extremely inflammatory writer, very, very provocative in the way he posed moral questions, very, very confrontational 
in his dealings with people who disagreed with him. His idea of being an editor was not to simply report the news, but to create the news by taking initiatives, criticizing people, calling people to account. It's a kind of advocacy journalism that we don't see anymore. Agents for the anti-slavery societies traveled the country, speaking in churches and meeting halls, spreading the doctrine of abolition. At first, black abolitionists belonged to separate societies, but eventually they joined with whites in a unified movement. Frederick Douglass, a former slave, quickly rose to prominence. I think he's one of the great orators of the 19th century. He had all the, all the, all the, the, the charm, uh, the good looks, the, the commanding presence, the ability to appeal to lofty uh, principles, uh, a wonderful knack for mimicking uh, people, a very booming voice, all of the things that you need in the pre um, sort of microphone era. People said I did not talk like a slave, look like a slave, or act like a slave. Some abolitionists suggested that Douglas in order to be genuine, should put a, a little bit of plantation language into his addresses. I mean, of course, this violated everything that Douglas stood for. So you have a situation in which uh, Douglas uh, is, is trying to break out both of the limits imposed uh, on him by the movement and also uh, having to live with the fact that he is recognized by many as a very uh, strong and commanding abolitionist. When Douglas joined the abolition movement, William Garrison was his mentor. But they parted ways when Douglas set out to publish his own abolitionist newspaper, The North Star. William Lloyd Garrison uh, can be read on the record as being absolutely furious that Frederick Douglass went off as an independent editor. Uh, Garrison saw himself very much as the sun in the galaxy of reform, and all the planets were supposed to revolve around him. Douglas's responses to Garrison were to call him for being condescending, for being patronizing. It seems to me that the idea of actually being able to have that kind of debate is one of the great magic moments of American democracy. This is a movement where people could actually debate their own feelings and points of view as people who are black and white and look each other in the eye and say what was on their mind rare at any time. Women also played an important role in the abolition movement. Speakers such as the Grimke sisters, Sojourner Truth, and Abby Kelly Foster are well known, but hundreds of women whose names are forgotten today also contributed to the cause. The grand silent army of abolitionists were the women who went door to door handing out petitions the women who put anti-slavery curriculum into their nursery schools, the women who, in a variety of different ways, queried their pastors over and over again about taking positions on slavery. Women were accepted in abolitionist circles as long as they remained in their place. No woman shall speak or vote where I am moderator. I will not countenance such an outrage on decency. At the 1840 meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society, Abby Kelly Foster was elected to serve on a committee. Many members of the society were aghast at the idea of women participating on an equal footing with men. Over this and other differences, the society split in two. But by then, the anti-slavery movement was large enough to encompass these divisions. Within four years, I have seen my principles embraced by thousands of the best men in the nation. I have seen prejudices, which were deemed incurable, utterly eradicated from the breasts of a great multitude. I have seen discussions of slavery going on in public and in private, among all classes and in all parts of the land, and more spoken and written and printed and circulated in one month than there formerly was in many years. It struck me as very remarkable that abolitionists who felt so keenly the wrongs of the slave should be so oblivious to the equal wrongs of their own mothers, wives, and sisters. In recruiting women to its cause, the abolition movement had awakened a sleeping giant. Women's rights emerges within anti-slavery 
Because the anti-slavery movement was fueled very strongly by religious convictions, they were coming from a higher authority than that of ministers or other authorities in the society. So when those, those authorities told them, you are women, you cannot be speaking in public, they overrode that and insisted on their right to speak. In 1840, when the female delegates to the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London were not permitted to take their seats, two women decided they'd had enough. Lucretia Mott was really the first to advocate women's rights. Elizabeth Cady Stanton represented a younger generation's entrance into this reform movement. And uh, the two of them together, uh, Lucretia Mott bringing the religious affiliation of the older generation, Elizabeth Cady Stanton bringing a more secular view together were a powerful combination. In 1848, they met again, this time in upstate New York. Stanton had recently moved to Seneca Falls. When she moved to Seneca Falls in upstate New York, uh, out of Boston, she was not feeling thrilled with the move. And when Lucretia Mott came and visited nearby, Elizabeth Cady Stanton went and poured her heart out to Lucretia Mott about her troubles and they decided they would have a convention to speak about the rights of women. Now, this action on their part in 1848 immediately created the Seneca Falls Convention that produced a Declaration of Women's Rights. On July 19th and 20th, a crowd of about 300, including 40 men, filled the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls to hear what the women had to say. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Oh, there's no doubt that it was the beginning of the women's rights movement as an independent movement. The Declaration of Sentiments was a revolutionary document. It asserted that woman was man's equal, that God had intended for women to participate in public life as fully as men, that no trade or profession, including that of preacher, should be closed to women, and that women should seek the right to vote. This last resolution was very controversial, but at the end of the convention, 100 men and women affixed their signatures to the Declaration of Sentiments. The reaction of the press was hostile. One writer pronounced it the most shocking and unnatural incident ever recorded in the history of womanity. In spite of the criticism, the movement for women's rights quickly gained momentum. Women agitated against the legal subordination of married women to their husbands, for the right to keep their own property and wages, and for the right to vote. They even promoted dress reform by wearing a shocking outfit known as bloomers. It's also interesting to know that that convention was the first of many that were held in the next 10 years. So there were conventions in Buffalo, Rochester, around the state of New York, in which uh, issues pertaining to women's rights were seriously discussed and debated. Some male abolitionists tried to discourage women from pursuing the work of women's rights, arguing that it would distract them from the more important work of abolishing slavery. But female abolitionists saw the connection between slavery and the oppression of women, and brought both issues together in their speeches. Perhaps nothing represented both causes so well as the words attributed to a former slave who had taken the name of Sojourner Truth. That man over there say that woman need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And aren't I a woman? I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And aren't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And aren't I a woman?
What is man born for but to be a reformer, a remaker of what man has made, a renouncer of lies, a restorer of truth and goodness? The fact the religious uh, innovations and revolutions and, and experiments of the 19th century had are in the area of what we call social gospel. Abolition, for example, uh, had its start with religious people. The um, feminist movement certainly started in the religious community. Um, the anti-alcohol movement, which uh, gained force, was almost entirely religious movement in the beginning. And these reform movements then in turn had a, a great effect on uh, our culture. The reform movements of the early 19th century created a lasting model for bringing about social change. You had to do a, a couple of things if you're going to bring about change in American society. You had to agitate. You had to let the country know that you were there and that you insisted on being heard. And secondly, you had to reach across the big racial divide. Without a sense of a real utopian vision, without a sense that God makes all things possible or something like that, the motivation to tackle something so difficult as the largest and most productive piece of the American economy, that is slavery. The notion that two, three, four millions of slaves could indeed be freed by demanding that they be freed is an extraordinary vision to have for democracy. It teaches us that one has to agitate and one has to pester and one has to, uh, to drive home uh, and to make the United States uh, live up to its principles. And I think that has been the, the, the story of, of struggle for, for social equality in, in, in the country.